Okay, do you want to get started, Louise? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Fleur. Um, thank you all for joining us and um, very big thanks to um, Andrew and from, from Gallagher and Brian from Inside Outside Management. And we also have a special guest with us um, today. It's Kent Rochester, who is um, a farmer down in the um, south coast of Western Australia, um, who's um, using the virtual fencing. So we're really looking forward to hearing from him. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Louise Edmonds. I'm the founder and CEO of Carbon Sync. Um, this is going to be a fairly snappy uh, presentation. There's a, a, a lot to get through, um, um, but we're, we're looking forward to um, uh, sharing this uh, exciting new technology and opportunity with you. Um, so Fleur, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so um, a introduction, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, overview of the uh, session. We'll have Andrew talking about the Gallagher virtual fencing technology. We'll talk, Brian will be talking about grazing management. Um, I'll have a little chat about how that relates to soil carbon sequestration and the opportunity that exists for farmers in that regard. Um, and then Kent will share um, some of his story of his experience using the technology and we'll have some time for question and answers at the end. Thank you. Okay, so handing over to Andrew now. So, okay. Yeah, so if you want to share uh, your screen. Yep, I'll share my screen. All right, so you should all see a, a slide saying pushing boundaries in livestock farming. So we'll get straight into the presentation. So um, the eShepherd virtual fencing solution really consists at the heart of it of a, a neck band, a virtual fencing neck band that goes onto all of your animals in the mob. Um, this is what it looks like on animals. So you can see that there's a device that hangs on the underside um, of every animal. And the, this is how we can contain animals within a virtual fence. So We've got a couple of different solutions available on the market at the moment. So we'll just go and have a look at those two different options right now. So the first option requires a base station to be located on the property. So you can see that in the center here that communicates with the neck bands via technology called LoRa communication. It's a low power, long range communication technology. And, um, for this type of setup, it's really ideal to locate a base station somewhere high up on the on a property. So if you do have a, a little hill somewhere, you place the base station up on top of that. Um, and it, if it's got great line of sight to a lot of the grazing area, then you've got good communication with the neck bands that are on the animals. The base station itself then connects to the via the cellular network, via the 4G network to the cell tower. And that's how we relay messages to and from a cloud database and back to an interface on your laptop or mobile phone. The second solution does away with the base station altogether. So um, there it goes. So the neck bands can now communicate directly with the cell tower. It does use a slightly different band compared to your mobile phone. So instead of the 4G network or the 5G network, it uses the LTE-M network. And that's got really great penetration and coverage. So um, I'll flip over to the coverage of that um, technology right now and just show you a map of Australia. This is the Telstra coverage map for the LTE-M network. So you can see WA has a really good segment of it covered down here. Um, and we've had some excellent results with that technology. And there's a significant cost saving involved in not requiring that base station as well to connect your eShepherd system to the network. So um, let's go and have a look at the pricing of a system right now. So um, first on the left-hand side here, we've got the um, base station system, the LoRa system. You can see each neck band is $350 excluding GST. And I will just point out there that that is for quantities greater than 60 neck bands. So smaller systems do attract some higher prices. Um, the base station is $6,000 excluding GST. And you do need a Wi-Fi station to go along with it as well. And that's $1,500. 
the Wi-Fi station is used to keep your neckbands up to date. So it um, connects your neckbands out in the field and updates the firmware because, of course, this technology um, it continues to evolve quite rapidly and we always have new changes to roll out. And it, an update happens just like your mobile phone gets um, updates as well. And then there's a subscription fee of $2 per head per month. So that's the LoRa-based system. And on the other side here, I'm not quite sure how well you can see, you might have um, some overlay of some people's faces there, but um, the cellular system, the neckbands cost exactly the same, $350 excluding GST. There's no cost of any other infrastructure required at all, but the subscription fee does go up a little bit to $2.50 per head per month. So that's the cost of it. And then, of course, um, we're all very excited about the upcoming on-farm connectivity program. Um, e Gallagher has applied for um, the eShepherd system to be part of that. So um, we haven't yet had a confirmation of what that looks like um, and whether we have been approved for it. But if we are approved, then this is what it would look like to maximize the the benefit from the government subsidy so you can you could potentially buy up to 172 neckbands at 350 dollars each which would be a total of sixty thousand and two hundred dollars the on-farm connectivity grant will provide uh, 30 uh, sorry 50 percent of of the cost of a system um, up to the value of $30,000. So really, if you wanted to get every single dollar of benefit out of the government grant, then uh, this, this is what it might look like. So you'd be out of pocket for $30,200. And, and then, of course, there is a subscription fee. And I've just pointed that out here for the next 12 months. That'd be $5,000. And of course, right, there's differences in how we might structure a package like this. And we may be able to uh, yeah, reduce the number of neckbands and include the first year of subscription, for example. So there's some different ways that we could take advantage of this on-farm connectivity program. So I'll just talk a little bit more about the eShepherd neckband and how it all works. So these devices are solar powered. There is a long life rechargeable battery inside the device. Um, it is a lithium based battery and we know that those batteries have a life expectancy of around eight years. We've used them extensively on some of our solar energizers. So we've got a high degree of confidence that you know, the battery will last. The housing is nice and robust. There's some soft overmolded plastic. That's the orange part. And even this, these other parts of the neckband are, are soft and they really absorb some of the impacts when animals are banging them up against concrete troughs and, and other obstacles in the yards and in the crush. So they hold up to that punishment really well. Um, of course, every neckband has uh, its own GPS location tracking inside it. So um, we know where every animal is. Um, it includes its own audio and pulse stimulus device. So there's a little speaker in there and that will give those audio alerts first as an animal comes up to the virtual fence line. Um, and if it doesn't listen to those audio alerts, that, that beeping, then it's followed by a pulse. And the pulse is delivered through the two chains that run up on either side of the neck of the animal. Um, the neckband does come with a three-year warranty we expect to get a seven to 10 year lifespan of each device. And um, you know, I've put that note down here, the unit can be serviced if required. So if a solar panel does get smashed or something does go wrong, then you can send it back in for a service, right? And you don't need to buy an entirely new device. You can um, just send it in, get it serviced and have it, um, we'll send it back out to you. So that's how we expect to get the seven to 10 year lifespan out of it. Okay, so, and then the system, of course, works via um, a web-based application. So you can do that on your computer, so either your, your, um, your laptop or a tablet. And I think Kent, right, you might speak about this. I think he, Kent is using it primarily on his tablet. And there's a mobile phone app as well, which has um, got some functionality. Um, 
You can use it from anywhere in the world, of course, because you're connected to the internet. So, you know, that is a proviso, of course, that you do need an internet connection. So I'll go and show a few examples of what some farmers have been doing with it. And this is um, a, a customer over in Western Australia in the Esperance region that's been doing some um, grazing on pearl millet. Um, he's been doing some script grazing there with around 500 um, Angus steers that you can see in the picture here. So I'll have a look what that looks like. He's got a drone and he's he just cordoned off, um, progressively was feeding out the pearl millet. And you can see that dead straight line in the in his crop there where, you know, on this side over here on the right-hand side, um, the, it's been grazed down and animals are progressively um, moving on. So really good way of uh, utilising a lot more of the pasture than previously. So just having a look at what that looks like on the eShepherd interface, and I'm not quite, um, sure how well you guys can see this, but there's a se series of lines here that you can see in this paddock here. So this paddock here is approximately 180 hectares. And um, this customer is breaking these down into around 20 hectare strips. So these are the animals here. And you can see there's a couple of different colors. Um, and that just indicates a few different type um, mobs of animals that he's released into this paddock. So some of them have um, been using the neck bands a little bit longer. And then others have come in and joined the mob. And it was really interesting to see how quickly the newcomers to this virtual fencing had picked up the technology and started to respond really well and just remain within these long strips. So um, the way that the farmer is using it is he simply opens up the next allocation. So you first extend the grazing area for the animals. And then very quickly, of course, they find themselves in the new pasture, in the fresh pasture, because it's uh, the greener grass is on the other side of the virtual fence. Um, so they move along and then you can send the next virtual fence to close off behind them, right, to prevent that back grazing. So really cool to see the, the operation um, progressing there. And now we'll show a couple of pictures from Kent Rochester down in Albany. Um, so this is his place here with some of the um, Angus animals that have got some neck bands on. Um, and again, I'll just sh share a screenshot of some of the operations that Kent was doing earlier on. So um, really intense grazing of a whole bunch of different mobs. So you can see that there were two different mobs in the one paddock here contained in some fairly small um, allocations. And I'll just go to the next slide where we zoom in on that a little bit. So you can see there's lots and lots of virtual fences being drawn. Um, the, and in this case, Kent is just moving the leading edge of the fence forward to progressively give them more pasture. And I'll let Kent really describe what he's been doing there and the results that he's been getting. And then you can see he is cutting off a little bit of the paddock as well to prevent that back grazing in certain areas and allowing animals to come into a central water point, right? The water location here. So really amazing stuff to see how well that's been working for Kent. And then over in New Zealand, just to show a few different use cases, um, we've got some uh, neck bands on bulls. These are some Hereford bulls um, in some uh, very wintry conditions here at this time. Um, and again, they've been using the system there to really intensively graze some winter crops. Um, so that's some fodder beet and some um, kale. And again, this may be a little bit uh, too far zoomed out to see nicely, but lots of different mobs being managed and having very small amounts of the winter crop being allocated to those bulls to tie them over through the winter period. And again, the system is holding up really well on some um, pretty challenging animals that are very um, feisty animals uh, the rest of the time. So, but the customer's been um, really wrapped with how well he can control them and allocate pasture. So, and that's instead of, of course, going out there and rolling out a whole lot of um, temporary electric fencing. So really good application there. So really, that's it for me. Really quick um, introduction to the virtual fencing system. I will just throw up this slide here to say that if you do want any more information about it, 
Um, Mark Dempsey is our man. Um, and give him give him a ring on his number there, or contact him via email, um, and he can he'd be happy to give you some more information about the system. So that's it from me. Thanks, Andrew. If we can hand over to Brian now. Would you like to share your slides for us, Brian, and introduce yourself? Excellent. Thanks, Phil. That's great. Wonderful. Uh, we're all good there? Fantastic. Uh, again, a huge thanks to, to Co-op and Sync for uh, creating the opportunity to, to have a chat and share, which is wonderful. And again, thanks to Gallaudet for the innovation and the tools um, to help us make uh, possible improvements to, to our country uh, in an easy way, which is fantastic. Um, let's get what's happening there. Excellent. Um, so I'm a holistic management educator and I teach holistic management um, around the ridges. Um, and again, holistic management is a decision making framework that allows us to to take information like this and make sure you know, it really works well for us and achieve the outcomes that we want. I'm a third generation uh, Zimbabwean farmer, so I started up cropping in Zimbabwe and um, my big passion was wildlife, and that's how I really got involved with the holistic management side of things, trying to build resilience back into, into wildlife areas. Um, you know, when you have a drought or a flood, your animals literally just die and die and die, and how do we get that resilience back into those landscapes? 24-odd um, years ago, we immigrated to central Queensland uh, and managed a couple of uh, cattle properties up there. And then more recently, we started our own enterprise where we did uh, grass-fed beef, pork, and eggs um on the new south wales coast um but one of my big inspirations has always been alan savory um a former soldier statesman environmentalist um recipient of the international banksy award alongside david attenborough uh david suzuki and other well-known people like that but also the founder of holistic management and the knowledge that has evolved from that um I find him to be a huge um, stimulation for, for my own uh, interest in the environment. One of his key thinkings was came from his time spent uh, developing a tracker unit in the army and also um, in his time in the big game areas in Africa where he was tracking animals or tracking humans in the war and just seeing the difference uh, in the impact of of the footprints and the impact the animals or the humans had when they were being hunted or, or followed. And then looking at that and then being able to work out the environmental benefits from that behavior, which has evolved literally over millions and millions of years. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, Alan's clear thinking on that has allowed us to now look at this and work out how it actually benefits environments. So, you know, life on Earth started sort of 800 odd million years ago with sort of simple algae and sponges. God knows who thought a sponge was an animal, but apparently it does. It produces semen and has eggs and does all those kind of cool things. But anyway, um, and then about 300 million years ago, we progressed to animals uh, as we know them today. And uh, these animals evolved with pack hunting predators. Uh, so about 300 million years ago, these types of animals evolved with predators. And of course, then about 7 million years ago, humans evolved with these animals and of course pack hunting predators and um you know the savory's thinking is really the only defense these large grazing animals have from these large predators and often they're pack hunting predators is to remain bunched um the minute you leave the mob you get eaten and my own experience in africa where we had a huge leopard population and we used to lose endless numbers of calves to leopards but the minute i started bunching my animals You'd see the leopard footprints there, but the leopards wouldn't wouldn't break the bunch. Anybody who's used dogs for herding, um, you know, your dog's the bravest thing on the outside of the mob. You know, rushes in there and bites ankles and bites noses and does all kinds of things. But take your dog by the scruff of its neck, drag it into the middle of your flock of sheep or drag it into the middle of your flock of cows, and it literally just almost wheezes itself. You know, it goes down the ground and scuttles out of there as quickly as it can. So this 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 um, behavior of staying bunched, protecting the individuals uh, has evolved over literally 300 million years 
to create huge environmental benefits. And um, they've evolved together. You know, so some of these environmental benefits are breaking soil crusts, where soil crusts form because for whatever reason, it might be uh, fire, it might be lightning strikes, it might be um, erosion, uh, and that raindrop action causes that compaction of the soil surface. So um, animals tightly bunched can break that surface, break that surface, create a divot there where the water's going to sit for a bit longer, create a, a better environment for seed to germinate, um, it creates an uneven surface. So again, that'll have a cooling effect. Um, so it has, again, big benefits on that soil crust where it opens it up, allows more water to infiltrate, allows more water to sit, slows the flow, but also creates a good environment for new plants to germinate, to establish themselves and get going. Um, again, please, this, this behavior has been going on for millions of years. It's not new, um, but we've changed the way we manage our animals. So all we're trying to do here is mimic and Virtual fencing is a tool that can help us do this. Um, you know, again, Savory picked up in his military days and again with wildlife, when animals are bunched and on the move from pack hunting predators, they tend to stamp on plants. They tend to trample plants, shrubs, grasses. And this creates that beautiful litter cover that's going to stop soil surface of evaporation. <clears throat> you know, water vapors you know, by, by far our biggest greenhouse gas and equates to about 50% of, of global warming as, as or effect as we see it today. And so being able to cover that soil like this literally stops that soil surface evaporation. In Namibia, <clears throat> in the west of Africa, the official government figures there on 96% of rainfall goes straight back up into the atmosphere from soil surface evaporation. And we know we can virtually stop that by bunching our animals, getting them to trample that material. As you can see in the picture here, it also concentrates dung and urine once those animals are bunched, which again allows things like dung beetles to literally crawl from one cow pad to the next and put that material back in the soil rather than it oxidizing. Every time we see a gray cow pad or, or sheep poo, it's gone gray because it's oxidized. And oxidation means nutrients going into the atmosphere instead of going back into our soil to support life so again these are all benefits that have evolved together with this predator prey relationship big predators keeping animals bunched keeping them on the move so, uh, i do a fair bit of traveling around australia and i'm constantly seeing areas of bush paddocks rangelands like this and every time you see organic matter that's gone gray Every time you see organic matter that's gone gray, it means it's oxidized. Those plants, when they initially dried and went brown, would have had a you know, protein content of 6 or 8%. You could have fed your animals on it. You can't feed animals that stuff now. It's got zero protein. Okay. Where's all that protein gone? It hasn't translocated to the root system because the plants, the nest, it dried out. There was no sap. It has all gone back into the atmosphere. Our soils are crying out for that carbon. They're crying out for that nutrient. And if we leave our plants to grow gray like this, uh, we lose that nutrient that goes up to the atmosphere. So again, animals, bunched animals, as they've been doing for 300 million years, is a key component to getting that nutrient back on the soil surface where soil life can take that nutrient and put it into the soil, creating good, healthy, uh, biodiverse soils full of worms, full of life. Um, so again, just using uh, the animals and you know um, the uh, virtual fencing is 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 a fantastic tool for helping us manage and create that density through the predator to prey relationship. So here are just some photographs of changes in very arid environments. So we're talking in a twenty four inch rainfall here, but very seasonal, literally only three or four months. And um, you know that's four years change. And the stock numbers on the same piece of land went from 183 uh, head to 650 in that same period. And there were no costs apart from getting the animals bunched and moving. So no seeding, no fossil fuel, no tractors, nothing. Just changing the way we manage the animals and principally bunching them up. So it's a fantastic tool. And you know, as Joel Sullivan always says, they're solar powered, they reproduce themselves and help they appreciate it on your books. So if you can use your animals in conjunction with 
fencing, virtual fencing, all these tools that are uh, available to us and plan our grazing, we can get some amazing results. And people all around the world today are getting amazing results in improving biodiversity. Now, some of the big paradigms I always find when you start talking uh, about bunching and using livestock as a tool, um, a lot of people say, oh, Australia didn't have, you know, these big herds. Well, again, the evidence is here. I mean, the, the biggest concentration of fossilized footprints is in Winton, 3,000 um, odd footprints, 160 individual uh, animals, and one big predator causing them to bunch and, and run along the edge of this fossilized lake. So Australia certainly had big herds. And in recent times, I know that uh, could be a touchy subject for WA, but the emu wars, <laughs> you know, the number of birds there was astounding. And yeah, people say, oh, well, you know, they didn't have hard. Well, we've all seen where kangaroos go under fences. They create that background. We've seen uh, emu footprints. We've seen kangaroo footprints. The way they do exactly what your livestock footprint does, chip up the soil. It's not about the shape of the foot. It's all about the timing. And that's where the management comes in. You know, uh, you would have all seen footprints along the beach. Uh, and if you're a plodder like I am, you know, it's all about compaction. However, if you look at the footprints of a jogger, again, different mind, more like that pack hunting predator relationship. Uh, the big toe digs in and you create a divot. I love the little picture on the right there because, uh, you know, we've all seen that that track from the back door to the hill's hoist in someone's back garden. Again, that's not caused by hard-hoofed animals. But we have a big paradigm that somehow Australia didn't have hard-hoofed animals and therefore hard-hoofed animals are bad. Um, you know, it's just a tool. We can use it to improve environments or we can use it to degrade environments. It's how we use it. And being able to bunch animals, uh, which is what this technology allows us to do, can have huge benefits, especially over you know, big areas of Australia. Um, just a couple of uh, quick pictures here. Um, so that paddock there has got some biddens. And you'll see on the right-hand side there, we're using bunching those animals to trample those plants into the ground, to get the mineral cycling to create a better environment for more productive plants. And again, just using the animals bunching, which again is what this technology is uh, doing. And, and we've seen evidence of that. Um, there are other ways of bunching animals. Here I've just put a, a, um, a lick block into a patch of wild raspberry. Lovely to eat, but uh, horrible thorny stuff. And uh, you know, here it is three hours later. Can we use animals to repair creek banks when they're properly managed? You know, so there's a, a creek bank that's starting to erode. It's got steep edges to it. Um, you know, we could go to local land care and get some funding and get a bulldozer and get some biodegradable netting and some seed. Or could we just use our livestock? Again, bunching them using technologies like this. Get them to trample down the edges. Get them to trample the seed into the ground. Get them to fertilize it. All solar powered. And again, you often have pushback and say, oh, you know, we shouldn't be putting our animals in the creek. That's a common paradigm that you hear all the time. Well, where the hell have these animals been drinking for the last 300 million years? In creeks, rivers, gullies, ponds. Why now suddenly is it bad? You know, is it the animal that's changed or is it because we now manage them? And it's technologies like this can, that can help us manage them better. And they'll, once you've done the trampling, always advisable to allow those environments to recover. Uh, this is bidding up just uh, south of, of, of where Louise and Co are, are sitting. And uh, these folks had some problems with uh, the air and lilies coming out of the, the creeks. And they used a, a bale of hay to, to do the same sort of thing and get that stimulation. And there it is you know, a day or two later, having pushed that in, lily back into into the creek edge where where it should be so again using this tool of animal impact this predator prey relationship to mimic nature to restore environments to to how they used to be i just wanted to share this one last one quickly actually i think there's one more um these are some of the folks earlier in the piece uh, so in a 200 mile rainfall area here so pretty arid very seasonal rainfall uh, lots of uh, bush um, and lots of bare ground and again, just bunching those animals, creating that chipping effect, the dunging effect, the trampling effect. And you know, 
over a sequence of years. And literally they went from just running goats and donkeys to now fattening bee families on that same piece of ground. And again, no seed, no fertilizer, no tractors, you know, expensive equipment, just managing your animals properly. And this is what this kind of technology can allow us to do. And just as a final one, just to finish off, uh, that's a copper tailings dump in Arizona. And one of the educators over there got a contract to rehabilitate it. And uh, again, he used temporary fencing. Uh, we could certainly use the, uh, the, the um, virtual fencing for this and just fed the animals on the side. And after uh, three years, that was the difference. So using the livestock properly managed with that predator-prey type connection to heal those environments, to restore biodiversity, restore resilience, and restore profitability to landscapes that have been degraded. So that's, uh, I think we're on time for a change. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Louise. We'll handle any questions later. Thanks so much, Brian. Yes, we have been getting a few questions. They're mainly um, techni technology questions, so we'll probably get Andrew to answer them at the end. But I'd like to hand over to Louise now to talk about soil carbon sequestration. Thanks, Louise. Well, thank you, Fleur. Um, so the presentation today yes. has been called Earn More, Work Less. Um, so we've seen some examples um, of um, increases in, in pasture productivity and carrying capacity um, brought about by um, utilising grazing animals um, as a tool to um, increase that impact and enhance um, the, the health of, um, of pastures. But now I'd like to talk about the other opportunity to generate income through um, grazing management, and that's through soil carbon sequestration. Um, so Carbon Sink are carbon farming project developers. What we do is we help you to generate an income through um, enhancing the health of your soil. Um, and it's been many years coming, but we are now in a position where farmers are starting to generate income for these activities. Um, and I'd like to share with you a few examples of um, where that has been done. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Fleur. Okay, so a fir the first example here is um, the Turpentine Carbon Project, which was conducted in Queensland. Um, this project um, started in 2016. Um, and the management strategy that was employed here was um, dividing uh, the original 10 paddocks into 150 paddocks using electric fencing. Now, as we can see, virtual fencing can probably really accelerate um, um, that work and make it much more, more effective, cost-effective and, and easier and cheaper. Um, um, so using the electric fencing, introducing new water points, um, enhancing biodiversity through the introduction of perennial grasses and subtropical grasses. Um, and this has resulted in an increase in carrying capacity for this property from eight to 20 stock days per hectare. So more than doubling the productivity of this property. Um, but what's even more exciting is that um, they have generated um, over 66,000 ACUs over the last five years. Um, at, and at today's carbon price, um, those ACUs are worth uh, two point nearly two point four million dollars, or one hundred and twenty four dollars per hectare per year. So that's a um, just under one ton of um, organic carbon per hectare per year um, has achieved that result. Um, we also have another example. Um, this one again is in Queensland. Um, this is a very this is a different soil type from the previous example, which was a very much a clay soil. Um, this is on a sandy soil. Um, so again, grazing management, planned grazing management and the introduction of multi-species um, into the pastures um, has resulted in a 1.23 tonne um, carbon sequestration rate per hectare per year um, at a value of about $109, $109 which is um, also uh, pretty outstanding. Um, so we um, have created a calculator on our website um, which will enable you to um, get a 
uh, ballpark estimate of um, what might be possible on your property under various um, carbon sequestration scenarios. Um, we take a very conservative approach um, we, uh, to, our, to, our, um, to our assessment. Um, in this example here, um, uh, there's a 1,000 hectare property um, that uh, we've, the parameters here is to put in your, um, the depth of the um, measurement. We can go down to one metre. In this example, it's um, um, 0.3 of a metre. Your estimated so soil bulk density, if you know it, this example is 1.3. Um, but you can leave those parameters the same. Um, the one that you might want to tinker with a little bit is um, the annual percentage increase in soil organic <laughs> So in this example, we're working with 0.01% increase um, per hectare per year. Um, over the life of the project, which is 25 years, this would result in a... Um, 0.25% uh, increase in soil organic carbon. So in real terms, we'd be going from 1% to 1.25% in 25 years, um, and that would result in a income of $66 per hectare per year. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to um, check out our, um, our, our, our carbon credit calculator. Um, if you'd like to keep in touch with what Carbon Sync is up to and learn more about, um, you know, carbon markets and uh, all of this kind of stuff, we encourage you to sign up to our newsletter um, and contact Gallagher if you would like to access the um, Rural Connectivity Grants Program. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I suppose now it's time to um, pass over to Kent. Um, we would love to hear your stories, Kent. Um, good, bad, and ugly, um, and um, and I'm sure there'll be many questions for for Ken in respect to um, the implementation of the technology. Thanks, Louise. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, this is something that I've been really interested in for a number of years since we first heard about um, virtual fencing, and um, earlier this year when it became reality um, that it was commercially available we we jumped on board with 50 collars to um, neck bands to um, figure out how they'd work and, and where they would fit and um, in our system where uh, grass finishing system finishing grass finished beef year round and um, we have been um, intensive grazing since probably 2018 or 19 um, and developing different different levels of that along the way. And um, I actually thought we were doing okay with that and doing a pretty good job. And then along came virtual fencing. Um, in the first month, my big goal was just to track how much of a um, penalty there would be on live weight gain and how much... Um, it would affect the cows or the animals and their, um, whether it would, you know, they would be confused or um, unsure about things and, and, and cop up a, um, a growth penalty. Um, we tracked them in paddock along the way and over the first month of using those 50, they actually gained a kilo more than anything else on the farm and um, we utilised nearly 20% less area per animal per day, um, which led me to ring Andrew and buy another bunch, so we're out to 300 net bands, and um, we've continued that um, that thing. I guess my takeaway from it now, and we're still learning every day, and um, it's got a long way to go forward from here, um, but the the more I put in, the more we get out. Um, we've um, the more breaks I put in, the more shifts, the more the tighter I bunch um, the animals up. Um, the more we're getting out, so we're um, we're achieving some pretty cool things. We did twenty hectares, set up 50, 50 plus animals on twenty hectares on a basically a thirty day rotation and. Um, I had to bring 150 more animals in 
to get our residuals back down on the at the start of the rotation to um, keep our residuals in in check and and manage to grow um, over two hundred and twenty kilos of beef in a month per hectare, um, which is really cool for for us and what we're doing. It's um it it's opened up my eyes to you know some new levels of production that we possibly can hit. We've had a um a really good dry winter, not so much for great spring, but a um a really awesome winter for growing cattle and grass. So that's probably um maybe my um glass half full outlook is get brought back to earth at some point. But so far um this is working fantastic. Um achieving some really, really cool things. Um, yeah, well, I think the, the, the three main reasons that I can think of that is that we've got our animals in much smaller groups. So we, we're down to bobs of 50 instead of 250 or 500 or whatever, just because we it, um, the labour component's completely gone. So then, we, then we're shifting way more often up to eight or ten times a day, um, which we would never be able to do with, with physical labour um, cost effectively. So the, the mob size is smaller, a lot less energy in the mob, a lot less um, jostling around. They're just a group of mates having a bite, a drink and a, and a sit down. Um, that more frequent moves in much smaller area seems to be main drivers that I think are, are using less grass to grow more beef in, in our system. Um, that's about all I can bring it down to at the moment, but um, yeah, I'm sure we'll learn a heap more as it all evolves. Um, that's really about it, guys, and apart from questions or whatever that I haven't thought of. Thanks for that, Kent. Really appreciate that. I'm sure there'll be some questions pop up. If people would like to type their questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of their Zoom screen, we'll address the questions one by one. Um, there's been a few questions already, and I think um, Andrew and or Kent might be able to answer these, so I'll just go through them one by one. Um, First of all, uh, we've got a question here. Can you track how active the animals are and get alerted if they're getting restless due to a lack of feed? So, Andrew, would you maybe like to start with that? And Kent might like to add something from his experience as well, please. Yeah, sure. So the, the system, just to give you a bit of an overview on how it works, the system does um, every neck band reports the animal's location every 10 minutes. Um, so you do get a pretty good understanding of where the animals have been and how active they are. Um, we haven't yet developed a lot of um, firmware features to be able to really track the um, activeness of animals. Uh, but that's just on the horizon, and that's why it's so important to uh, be able to do firmware updates on all the neck bands as well, because we are continually evolving that side of things. So whilst at the moment we've really focused on the virtual fencing aspects of the technology, um, these are some of the things that will come in time. So right now we don't really have a way to differentiate animals that may be more active than others and um, send an alert accordingly. Um, but it's certainly capable, the technology is capable and, and even the hardware that you know, Kent has and um, that we have released has the sensors on board to be able to do that in future. It's just a matter of developing the features in, in the firmware, which is really just a software that runs on the neck band itself. Thanks, Andrew. Kent, did you have any insight on that question? Do you get any sense from your technology that you're using in regards to animals getting restless due to lack of feed? Not necessarily restless, but um, as the platform stands at the moment, um, probably after the first month that I had them on, we went away on holidays and because I was pretty um, addicted to the whole thing for starters and was watching it really closely, I was using, there's a, a heat map that shows 
uh, where the animals have been and, and how much uh, time they've spent there. And I could sort of really half read how well they were um how well they were covering their their area and needed a fresh break um just by looking at that and uh, occasionally phoning home and getting someone to have a bit of a look but grazed them for a week or so from from afar and didn't miss the residuals too much just just following that and a little bit of knowing how much area per day each mob sort of needed Thanks, Kent. We'll move on to the next question. If 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 that person who asks that question or um, wants to ask a follow up question, by all means, type it into the chat. Another question is: Has there been testing with cow and calf units? That is, will calves stay with the cow with the unit on, or are there smaller, less cost calf units? Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, really good question, and and we do get that a lot. And yes, we've now seen um, and quite a number of operations with uh, cow calves. Um, and in fact, right through the entire reproductive cycle, so from you know get, going getting in calf right throughout the pregnancy period, having the calf with the neck band on still, so throughout the calving period, and then throughout that um, initial growing period, all the way up to weaning. Um, and yes, it works really well. So, um, you know, some farmers even try and do this deliberately by uh, with temporary electric fencing and they might set the temporary electric fence a little bit higher so the calves can graze ahead of the mums and get into some of that really good feed. And they do really well in that scenario. So with the virtual fencing technology, of course, there is no you know, barrier at all between the mums and the calves. So they happily go ahead and feed on some of the best grass. Um, their weight gains have you know, been significantly higher than what um, some of the producers have seen previously. So it works really well. Um, the mums come up to the virtual fence line, they get the audio tone and are told, no, you're staying back here. They might call out to the calves and there's no issue with the calves finding their way back to the mums, right? So it's it, it just works exceptionally well and hasn't um, yeah, there haven't been any issues at all with um, you know, mums being separated from their calves. They always find each other again, probably more so than even in other traditional senses where there are either fences in place or, or other um, barriers for them to rejoin each other. So, yeah, works well. Just following up on that one, there's just been a question. What about calf safety, for example, if there's no other fencing? Right. Um, look, we haven't really seen those kind of scenarios yet where there's no other fencing whatsoever and, and you know, animals might be able to get out onto, say, public roads or something like that where there may be a fencing concern. I'm not quite sure whether that's the question here, whether it is something around you know, calves then getting out onto, um, into traffic or something like that. Um, uh, you know, most or a lot of properties at least have some boundary fencing. So, um, yeah, I haven't really come across that sort of scenario where that's been a concern. Thanks. This is a question for uh, Kent. Um, Kent, have you seen any visual or other evidence of benefits to the pasture or the soil since the implementation? Yeah, so same as that, more you put in, the more you get out kind of thing. We're finding a really even graze now as we're as we're able to, the, the more smaller breaks that we put in there, the, the manure distribution's really good, the, the utilisation's really even, and um, regrowth is really even too. So we're, um, that's looking, looking really good. Thanks, Kent. Uh, another question for you, Andrew. When will East Shepherd be available in Victoria? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a difficult one. So we do have um, some animal welfare legislation blocking the adoption of virtual fencing in several states of Australia. So both Victoria, New South Wales, and South Australia. Um, we, we can't use virtual fencing there. Um, the legislation that's blocking us was due to the introduction of some, some uh, rules around the use of uh, the uh, virtual fencing dog collars, right? The electric dog collars. 
And the way they worded that legislation basically meant it's not allowed to be used on any other animal. So there has been some progress in New South Wales where um, there's been a parliamentary inquiry looking into the technology and the animal welfare aspects of it. Um, we've been involved the best we can to really educate those um, that committee um, to try and give evidence on on um, you know the that there really uh, are no um, animal welfare impacts that we've come across yet. So, um, uh, but of course, you know this could be a lengthy process to change legislation. So, unfortunately, we really don't have a timeline on it. But but certainly, the one thing I will say. It, it, we had the same legislation in place in WA and it was really grassroots pressure from producers ringing up their parliamentarians saying, guys, we really want to use this technology. You know, this could have some huge benefits for it. It was that grassroots pressure that actually overturned the legislation or caught, made an exemption, I should say, um, for um, the technology to be able to be adopted, right? So, um, yeah, if if you're really passionate about it, please ring your politician and give them a nudge. They they need it, right? A good boot in the butt will maybe move things along. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we're getting close to time, but we have got a little bit of time left. There is someone who joined the webinar a little bit late and is asking about the costs and subscription costs. Um, Andrew, do you mind just popping up that slide and sharing it with the group again before we wind up? Um, and I'll yep. just keep an eye out for other questions. But since we've got a little bit of time left, I thought we could answer that question rather than have to follow up with them afterwards. For sure. Let me just share my screen again and I'll try and bring up that slide. So it's this one, share that, and I'll just make it full screen. Oh, come on, come on, computer, you can do it. No. Um, uh, let's go over this way. Here we go. All right, here's that slide. So um, just for context, there are two different systems um, and it's primarily divided into how the system communicates back to the eShepherd platform. So the LoRa system requires a base station. So there is some infrastructure costs associated with that. But you can see the neckband price is the same for both types of systems at $350 each, excluding GST. Um, and again, I'll just point out there the little asterisk, which means that you know that is that price is for um, quantities greater than 60 neckband. So smaller volumes do attract a higher price. Um, and then the subscription fee is $2 per head per month for the base station system and for the cellular system uh, the subscription fee is slightly higher at two dollars fifty per head per month yeah and just confirming part of that question was how long the warranty is for so i think you said three years that's right that's right yep yeah. three years um warranty on the neck band and um, as I said, it is a serviceable device. So if something does go wrong afterwards, we, we do stand behind it. We do want to make sure that you get um, a long use out of this device. Um, uh, and Gallagher, if you're familiar with Gallagher and its other products, we, we do like, like to make sure that you get value for money there. So, um, yeah, we do stand behind it and we'll um, repair that as well. Okay, just the last question now, and then we'll um, wrap up. Is virtual fencing for sheep on the horizon? How far away and any indication of cost, Andrew? Yeah, look, it's a question that we get a lot um, and it's not on the imminent horizon. We are certainly, it is on our roadmap to eventually have a solution for sheep. There are a number of challenges with sheep. Um, one of them is the their woolly coat and being able to effectively deliver a pulse. Um, the other um, a, a problem at the moment is that um, there's a lot of the same technologies required in a neckband that might be suitable for, for sheep um, that goes into the virtual fencing neckband for cattle. Um, so... At the moment, where the with um, the volumes that are being produced, it's really hard to get the cost down. 
So we would need to have some further transformations in technology to really lower the cost and make it, um, you know, uh, uh, the right sort of value for for a much lower value animal like a sheep. So um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will get there in time, but it will probably take a number of years to really um, either increase uh, volume production and drive costs down um, or further leaps and bounds in technology that will take cost out of it in that way. Okay. And just one final question. Um, we've got a, a question here for Laura. Do you need both the base station and Wi-Fi or is it one or the other? No, you do need both of them. Now, you only need one Wi-Fi station. Um, so th this device, um, as I said, is only used to update the firmware of the neck bands. Um, and the base station is also required for that continuous communication um, on for everyday use. And some systems may need more than one base station as, as well to provide full coverage of a property. So... Um, yeah, and you know, for much larger properties, you might end up with quite a lot of base stations as well, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So, um, yeah, be mindful of that as well. Uh, last one for you, Louise. Were there any rangeland examples of carbon projects? Um, no, not in Western Australia. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with. Uh, um, the East Coast, but in Western Australia, you can't undertake soil carbon sequestration projects in the rangelands. Okay, that's it for questions and answers. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our presenters, Andrew from Gallagher, Brian from Inside Outside Management, Kent Rochester, our farmer case study, and, of course, Louise, my boss here at Carbon Sink. Thanks everyone for joining us and keep in touch with us and we'll keep you up to date with developments in this space. Thanks everyone.